This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Leap Day Cardiology Conference. Um, uh oh, everything went to sleep. There we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. This morning we have uh, Brian Wells with us. M most of you know Brian is an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology. He did his uh, medical training at UAB, where he was uh, in. Well, he did his medical school at MCG, and then his internship residency at uh, UAB and chief resident there and came here for cardiology fellowship and we were fortunate enough to uh, hold on to him. He's been on faculty for almost four years now, right? Yeah. And uh, it has uh, built a very robust practice in the area of vascular medicine, which is really an important evolving area and one that's a really, I think, important interplay between medicine and surgery. And so he's going to talk to us today about an interesting aspect of vascular medicine, fibromuscular dysplasia. Brian, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Taylor, and thanks everyone for having me. So, uh, like Dr. Taylor said, uh, the interest with vascular medicine, um, I was fir first exposed to FMD about two years ago. We had the first ever world symposium for FMD, and that was held at Cleveland Clinic and included practices uh, from the United States and Canada and France. And we have really made a push uh, uh, since then in the past few years to learn more about this disease that we really we discovered 80 years ago, but haven't learned a lot uh, until recently. So our knowledge uh, has been slim, but the, it is growing exponentially, uh, particularly with the uh, establishment of the uh, National FMD Registry th through the FMD Society of America, uh, of which we're a part of now. I'm happy to say our IRB was approved as of last week and we'll be able to start rolling, enrolling patients in that registry. So this talk is very timely as well, but this uh, is um, a nice overview of FMD for some of you that aren't familiar with it. Uh, a lot of this data comes from the scientific statement, which was the first publication. Actually, first there's now two, but the first publication of the uh, FMD registry from the United States. So uh, the objectives for today would be to describe the epidemiology and diagnostic findings of FMD, list the common clinical manifestations of FMD, and describe the appropriate management and surveillance of patients with FMD. I'll start with a few board-style questions. In the general population, which of the following is the most prevalent cause of renal artery stenosis? If there's any fellows in the room, you've probably seen this question before. You know the answer. Good. So I heard B, and second, a, a second would be fibromuscular dysplasia. Very good. Which of the following statements regarding percutaneous angioplasty is true for renal artery stenosis? So for non-osteal renal artery stenosis or FMD, good results are obtained, obtained with angioplasty. B, angioplasty of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis has excellent results. C, in Takayasu arteritis, lesions are amenable to angioplasty. D, stents have not changed the rate of restenosis in stents with atherosclerosis, atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. A, hey, very good. You, you guys already know all this stuff. I don't even know if I need to give the talk. So I'll try to teach you something today, but that's exactly right. So the, the, the take-home point there is that atherosclerosis, <clears throat> we do, we do uh, there is a benefit with stenting to prevent instant restenosis. But for FMD or non-atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, you don't, need the, you don't need the stent. In fact, stenting can damage the vessel. The vessel is so fragile that we try to avoid that and prefer balloon angioplasty. And, uh, 80 and there's an 80% success rate with that with minimal re, uh, uh, restenosis. So here's an outline of the talk for today, background, epidemiology, genetics, and classification, and then we'll go through systematically the manifestations of FMD, which include primarily renal, carotid, and most importantly for the folks in the room, coronary FMD, and a few comments after that. So these are, these are real cases. This pa these are patients that presented to, presented to our vascular medicine clinic within the past year or two. Uh, a typical FMD patient, a 39-year-old woman with no significant past medical history. She had abrupt onset, uh, difficult to control hypertension requiring four medications. ER visits for hypertension, headaches, and elevated creatinine. So appropriately, a secondary workup for hypertension was performed, which included a renal duplex ultrasound. 
And as you can see here, uh, this is of moderate technical quality, but the kidney uh, at the top of the screen here. And what you see, even if you don't read vascular ultrasound, is you immediately notice aliasing suggestive of turbulent flow in the distal renal artery as it goes into the kidney. So you know something's abnormal there. Similarly, uh, velocities are up. You have spectral broadening. A normal velocity in the kidney should be less than 180 centimeters per second. So you have elevated velocity, spectral broadening, and a parvus tarted waveform distally in the kidney, all suggestive of significant renal artery stenosis. So we performed a diagnostic angiogram and subsequent angioplasty. This patient had <clears throat> FMD of the mid renal artery that was hemodynamically significant. She also had an incidental saccular aneurysm that was about 1.5 centimeters. So she had an excellent response and actually came off all four of our antihypertensives within a week. So dramatic response, she was cured, and again, there's a 60% cure rate with renal FMD. And then the question was, what do we do with this, this saccular aneurysm that we left? So for most visceral aneurysms, we, we, the threshold to treat is about two centimeters. When we spoke with vascular surgery about that, the saccular nature of the aneurysm made us a little more concerned, and we went ahead and decided to treat. Some of the options would have been coiling, covered stent, and surgical, but perhaps clip, clipping if needed. The CT revealed a fairly straight segment that was amenable to covered stenting. And so she did have a, uh, a covered stent placed by vascular surgery that was successful. The only small complication that she had throughout her entire course was a small infarction uh, of, of, the, of the, one of the renal artery branches during the placement of this covered stent, which caused her pain for about 24 hours. But again, cured, cured of her hypertension, uh, living a normal life, uh, and uh, the aneurysm has been treated, and all she needs is surveillance and some appropriate medical therapy. So what, so what do we know about FMD at this point? Again, there's a lot to learn. So some of the slides I'll tell you, here, here's what we don't know, and here's what we need to know. Okay, so uh, we know that it's non-atherosclerotic and non-inflammatory. So it's not a vasculitis and it's not caused by your traditional cardiovascular risk factors. But it does cause stenosis, occlusion, aneurysm, and dissection in the affected vascular beds. It most commonly involves the renal and carotid arteries. It used to be thought that the renal arteries were the most common uh, organ involved, but uh, through information from the FMD registry, we found that, that it is equally prevalent in both the renal and the carotid arteries. Due to the somewhat vague nature of the patient's presentation, lack of awareness with both the patients and, and our treating physicians, there's a delay in diagnosis. The presentation is around age 40 years on average, but the patient generally develops some manifestation five years prior to that. And because of all those things, like I mentioned, the lack of diagnostic criteria and awareness, there's that delay. It's more common in women and younger, younger patients, typically middle-aged women. So we first learned about FMD in the 1930s, about 80 years ago. There was a five-year-old boy with resistant hypertension that was cured with a unilateral nephrectomy, and the authors, the surgeons Ledbetter and Birkeland, stated that they encountered a intra-arterial mass of smooth muscle, and they had encountered uh, a peculiar new finding. And this, again, this patient was cured uh, he was left without a kidney, but uh, they found that removing this area cured the renal, uh, the renal artery stenosis and hypertension, and we started to learn more about FMD uh, subsequent to that. So uh, the histological uh, term fibromuscular hyperplasia was introduced in 1958. We then found FMD in the carotids in the 1960s, and some of those patients were, were uh, treated with uh, carotid resections for uh, symptomatic non-atherosclerotic uh, ICA stenosis causing strokes. The pathologic criteria that we used up until two years ago was developed in the 70s, and we used those. I'll explain that to you and why we changed the, the diagnostic criteria. Uh, and we, we used that for 40 years until recently, uh, just two years ago. And now we have the FMD registry. The first publication included approximately 500 patients, and so now we have over 1,000 patients in the registry. So the prevalence is unknown. We suspect that it may be up to 1% of the general population. So we know that from autopsy studies. In other interesting angiographic studies, uh, such as hypertension trials like coral, 
or renal donor trials, we see a higher prevalence rate up to five to six percent. Now, that, there's obviously some confounder there because those patients either have resistant hypertension and are being enrolled in a trial, or they have a family member as a renal donor that has some form of kidney disease. Uh, so there's some confounder there, but we suspect that the prevalence may be up to one percent. We we've seen similar, slightly less prevalence in the carotids. Um, it may also be that the angiographic criteria that we're using is slightly more sensitive than our histologic criteria. The cause is unknown. It affects women uh, more than men by a ratio of 9 to 1, so 90 percent women. We don't know the cause. There has been some association with smoking. Uh, 30 to 37 percent of patients with FMD are smokers compared to 18 percent of age and sex match peers. So that's an interesting finding. We always discuss smoking cessation with these patients. There is a hormonal theory uh, that has not been proven in any of our studies, uh, given that there's the, uh, the female predominance, uh, but we do not know the cause. <clears throat> We, we are actively looking at the genetics of this, and genetics are hard, uh, as particularly with FMD. It's a rare disease. We're not even sure what the phenotypes are. There's different va vascular beds involved. Our, our diagnostic criteria is changing, and there's probably some form of variable penetrance there. We, we suspect that this is like a bicuspid aortopathy type of presentation, where even if you have the gene, you're gonna, you, your phenotype could be completely different uh, than the next person's. But we've looked at all the typical uh, causes of connective tissue disease with our genes, and we haven't identified one particular gene. Two interesting findings during the past few years have been upregulation of TGF beta. TGF beta 1 and 2 in a uh, cohort, cohort of 47 patients with FMD. So that was very interesting. Um, we found an actin regulator gene in 200, 409 patients compared with their, their age and sex match peers. Uh, so, so we're making progress on that. And it's a, it, is, it appears to be some type of connective tissue disease. And um, uh, the, other, the other types of uh, s similar family umbrella of connective tissue disease like Lois Dietz, Ehlers-Danlos type 4, and Marfans are, are all overlapping and, uh, and are considered when we do the, the genetic analysis. We do know that we think 7% we think of these cases are familial or genetic, and if you do have a genetic predisposition, you're likely to have a more severe phenotype, multiple vascular beds involved, for example. So here is the old histologic criteria on your left and the angiographic criteria on your right. And I'll show you some images to explain what this is. So the histologic criteria was broken down into primarily medial or intimal, okay, fibroplasia. The most common by far is medial fibroplasia, and that's your typical beads on a string appearance that you've probably seen in images and heard about. Uh, paramedial fibroplasia is slightly more rare, and intimal is the is the focal concentric stenosis that is more common in younger patients and boys. Adventitial is very rare. But what we did for about 40 years, we weren't, we're, we weren't taking histology, we were doing less surgeries, and we were making a histologic diagnosis by angiographic criteria, and it wasn't making much sense. So again, recently did 2012 in France and 2014 AHA, we, we simplified this, and now the terms are multifocal, FMD, which corresponds to the medial type FMD, and focal FMD, which corresponds to your intimal type FMD. And that just correlates simply with what you're seeing with your angiogram. So here are some examples <clears throat> of multifocal FMD. So this is your medial type or multifocal FMD of a carotid and a renal artery, respectively. It typically, in general, FMD occurs in your mid to distal arteries. You see the beating, the alternating areas of stenosis and dilatation, which creates that, that beads on a string appearance. And you can appreciate how the, the proximal and osteal uh, uh, area of the vessel, where you typically have atherosclerosis, is spared. And on histology, you have medial thinning with these fibromuscular ridges that are classic for medial FMD. Conversely, focal FMD, or the intimal type, again, more common in younger pediatric patients, you have one concentric stenosis or band causing renal, uh, renal artery or carotid stenosis here and here, for example. In histology, you have relatively normal media and adventitia, 
but you're into a concentric thickening. Paramedial FMD is similar to your medial FMD. The only major difference is your beads are smaller than the reference vessel and paramedial, whereas with medial, your beading is larger than the reference vessel. So again, our new HA classification is multifocal or focal FMD. Multifocal correlates with medial FMD, beads on a string, alternating dilatation and, and constriction, and rarely paramedial. Focal is your intimal FMD, causes a focal concentric or tubular stenosis. All can cause aneurysms, dissections, tortuosity, and, and medium-sized vascular beds. So how do these patients present? Again, the presentation is somewhat vague. Hypertension, headaches, dizziness. So you can imagine why there's that delay in diagnosis when you have a middle-aged, <clears throat> otherwise healthy patient coming into your office with this cluster of symptoms. Okay, they may be disregarded, they may be told they had vertigo, considering autoimmune diseases, and they can get bounced around from physician to physician until someone perhaps uh, thinks about resistant hypertension and, or hears a brewery and, and initiates a workup. Something that, that is not pathognomonic or unique to FMD, but much more prevalent than the general population is the pulsatile tinnitus or the whooshing sound that you can hear in your ears. It's generally, uh, it's benign, but it, they're basically hearing turbulence from the tortuosity of their vessels. And, and this is the most common thing that, that they complain of, and it's remarkable how many patients with FMD have this. Uh, again, not, not diagnostic, but much more prevalent in the FMD population. So always ask about pulsatile tinnitus and always listen for breweries. A brewery is always abnormal in any patient, but in a patient with, that doesn't have traditional atherosclerotic risk factors uh, should be a, another red flag. And rarely you have the patients that are presenting with more catastrophic symptoms like a stroke or dissection, and, the, and, and we di make the diagnosis that way, and approximately 5% are diagnosed incidentally by imaging. So, again, going through these symptomatically, we'll have a few slides, uh, slides on renal and carotid and then coronaries. So renal, most commonly the presentation is resistant hypertension in a young patient. Uh, suspect this when the patient is less than age 35 years, and again, the average age is approximately 43 years. Always listen for abdominal brewies. Um, I'll show you a case in a minute on a patient that presented with an abdominal brewy. Um, they can present with renal artery dissections or infarctions. It's rare for this form of renal artery stenosis to progress to end-stage renal disease. Headaches are, are a very common uh, presentation as, uh, as well due to the resistant hypertension. So how do we make the diagnosis? Okay, so you have to have that index of suspicion, and you're generally doing a resistant hypertension workup, and we usually start with the renal duplex, but any, any mode of imaging is appropriate. Renal duplex we do in the office, and it's safe. You avoid contrast and radiation. But if you see, like I showed you with the first case, turbulent flow, tortuosity, evidence of stenosis in a patient without atherosclerosis, think about FMD, especially if it's in the mid to distal vascular bed. And we, once we see that on duplex, then we do a confirmatory test with some form of angiogram, MRA, CTA, or invasive angiogram. Um, one thing that's important to note is that the diagnostic criteria that we validated for duplex ultrasound does not apply to FMD. So these velocity and ratio criteria that we use for renal duplex and carotid duplex are not validated and don't apply, so our report should not quantify that diagnosis, but they should be suggestive of FMD and require for further evaluation. <clears throat> um, similarly, you, you cannot quantify the diagnosis by angiogram um, based on the lumen size. We cannot tell how tight the stenosis is within a web by looking at the angiographic appearance. We have to do a hemodynamic study with a, with a flow wire and FFR to prove whether or not the lesion is hemodynamically significant. So an FFR less than uh, 0.9 or, or a gradient of 10 millimeters of mercury has to be, has to be documented. So revascularization, what are the indications? As you would expect, resistant hypertension, generally acute onset, or if there's some problem like a dissection or an aneurysm that also needs to be dealt with. Again, stenting is not needed and can potentially be harmful and can uh, induce a dissection. 80% uh, improvement success rate with balloon angioplasty of, of 
renal FMD. Surgery is generally re reserved for torturous vessels, aneurysmal disease, distal disease, et cetera. So here's an example of renal FMD that was treated with balloon angioplasty. You could appreciate the flow wire here. And you can also appreciate that there's still some irregularity to the lumen based on the angiogram. But again, we're not quantifying the stenosis based on the angiographic appearance. It has to be by flow wire. So after the balloon angioplasty, surveillance, uh, restenosis is most common in the, within the first year. So we do a baseline renal duplex at about one month and then every six months for approximately two years. Restenosis is rare, and we think that that's usually uh, incomplete treatment of the first balloon angioplasty, uh, but it is important to look for that. It's also important for the patient to monitor their creatinine and their blood pressure. Usually the first sign of, of restenosis that the patient presents because their, their blood pressure is going back up. So here's another case similar to that. So a 40-year-old woman uh, presented with an acute onset hypertension uh, presentation and the referring cardiologist noted an abdominal brewy and performed a secondary hypertension workup again with the renal duplex ultrasound. And here is the aorta and cross section in your, in your renal artery coming off to the right. And again, you appreciate aliasing, turbulent flow, and tortuosity in the right renal artery. Elevated velocity, spectral broadening, and interestingly here, by ultrasound, which is rare, you can appreciate that there may be an aneurysm. You have dilatation up to one centimeter in the distal right renal artery. So an angiogram was, was performed, and it was remarkable how similar the duplex findings were to the angiographic findings. So you have significant uh, renal FMD. You have two aneurysms that are probably up to one centimeter proximally and then more noticeable distally and beating throughout the mid to distal right renal artery. She also had FMD of her left accessory renal artery as well. <clears throat> and her, her FMD was significant by FFR. She underwent a balloon angioplasty. And here's the angiographic result post balloon angioplasty. So it does look good. And she had no gradient post balloon angioplasty. Here's, here's a picture of the balloon inflating and the post-procedure result. And this pa particular patient was on three antihypertensives prior to the procedure, and now she's on one. She takes Losartan daily, so a success. And the, the, these, these patients that I presented to you are typical of the patients that are presenting to our vascular medicine clinic. So uh, moving on to carotid FMD, uh, they may simply be diagnosed with a brewing that you hear, or incidentally, uh, on imaging, and they may present with headaches. Again, I mentioned the pulsatile tinnitus that, it, that can occur in up to a third of these patients. And some present with more concerning symptoms, neurologic findings, TIAs, dissections, and stroke, and a small percentage of those patients as well. <clears throat> Another important point is that <clears throat> all FMD patients are at higher risk for intracranial aneurysms, but if you have carotid FMD, your incidence will be even higher, so you always have to evaluate for intracranial aneurysms as well. It's carotid dissection specifically, 15 to 20 percent of spontaneous carotid dissections are due to FMD, and it's the initial presenting event in 12 percent of FMD patients. So they'll present with headache, cranial nerve abnormalities, neurologic focal, focal symptoms, Horner syndrome, most will have some type of prodrome prior to their uh, uh, presentation with the dissection. And um, oftentimes in vascular clinic, the patient is presenting to us after they've had this spontaneous carotid dissection, and the question is, well, was this FMD? Again, is this that 15 to 20 percent because they don't have any other risk factors of trauma, vasculitis, and atherosclerosis, and, and so forth? So we do an FMD workup after their spontaneous dissection. And the, what the... What the patient usually wants to know, is this, is this going to happen again? Again, this was a, you typically a young, healthy female that uh, was, was productive and wants to move on with her life and um, what's going to happen moving forward. And it's always reassuring to, to, to tell them this data that re, uh, the reoccurrence rate is relatively uncommon, less than 1% per year. So their life expectancy is that of an of otherwise normal, healthy person, and most people don't redissect their carotid arteries. We recommend lifestyle modifications like avoiding neck, neck manipulation, chiropractors, roller coasters, things like that. Here's an example 
of a flap from a carotid dissection from the carotid bulb into the ICA. So diagnosis of carotid FMD by duplex. I already mentioned for the renal duplex ultrasound, again, we're looking for signs of FMD, but we can't diagnose stenosis. So our reports will typically state something along the lines of there is increased turbulence, elevated velocities, and tortuosity in the mid to distal vessels suggestive of FMD, and that's what our report should say. It won't, it won't quantify stenosis like we typically do for atherosclerosis. The S-curve has been popular in the literature for the past few years because it's much more common in the FMD population than, than the non-FMD population, particularly if you have a patient that's younger than age 70 and that should not have atherosclerosis or hypertension. If you see the S-curve, you need to think about FMD. And if we do diagnose carotid FMD, we do surveillance similar to what we do with the appropriate use criteria for atherosclerotic carotid stenosis, but it's generally not progressive if you have medial type FMD. Here are some examples of what we're seeing on carotid duplex. You usually don't see this, this pretty of a picture on B-mode imaging, but here you can actually appreciate some of the, some of the beating, but more importantly, the tortuosity in the mid to distal carotid artery with tortuosity by color Doppler. And here, for example, you have elevated velocities, spectral broadening, and turbulent flow. And here's that characteristic S-curve that I mentioned. So if you have a patient without atherosclerosis, without hypertension, younger than age 70, and see the S-curve, have a high index of suspicion for FMD. So other advanced imaging like CTA is very good. Um, we're not sure uh, what the sensitivity and specificity is for CTA and MRA. It's probably uh, compa fairly comparable to the gold standard of invasive angiogram, but it's, it's nice to make the diagnosis w uh, of the beating when your carotid duplex is suspicious for FMD. And again, similar to what I mentioned for the renal duplex and renal imaging, you cannot quantify the stenosis. You have to quantify stenosis with a flow wire. So... Angiogram, in this particular patient, you see tortuosity with an S-curve in the distal carotid artery with some beading suggestive of FMD. So you have, you can have your string of beads appearance, you could have your tubular or focal FMD. Uh, smooth lesions, outpouching, which is a pseudoaneurysm, which is generally thought to be a, a localized uh, previous uh, dissection. So who gets revascularized for carotid FMD? We generally reserve that for a patient with symptoms, in fact, recurrent symptoms. So it's a class three indication if you see carotid FMD that in the patient's asymptomatic. We generally recommend PTA if there's recurrent uh, neurologic symptoms. PTA rather than stenting, IVIS can be used to quantify the stenosis. And distal protection in this case is challenging because again, the stenosis and the disease is in your, your distal extracranial carotid artery, so you have less room for your, for your embolic protection device. Pseudoaneurysm, usually the result of a prior dissection with carotid FMD. This can be treated if needed if you have persist persistent symptoms or an expanding pseudoaneurysm. Uh, could be used with, uh, uh, with a covered stent. Coil embolization could be used for treatment. Uh, and it is safe and effective. The, this particular series of, of patients did well. They had carotid FMD, and, uh, and they were stented for various reasons. The most common was uh, pseudoaneurysm, and it and did appear to be safe. So I mentioned pseudo -cere cerebral aneurysms. There's a significantly increased risk if you have carotid FMD as high as 50%. That may, that's probably an overestimate because the patients that we're getting imaging on are generally the patients with carotid FMD and with symptoms. But we know that it's at least 7% in all FMD patients. So those patients need appropriate surveillance and treatment if necessary, usually with coil embolization, and they're followed by, by neurosurgery. So you may see something along the lines of this, an intracranial aneurysm. In this case, was treated with, with a clip as well as a coil, which you can appreciate in these views here, here, and here. Okay, this is a bit of a show and tell. There are also entities that are more rare than your typical FMD. Okay, so atypical FMD, this is a carotid artery. Here is your common carotid, ECA, carotid bulb, 
and ICA. And what you see here is this irregularity, a horn, if you will, or a web in the carotid bulb extending, extending into the proximal ICA. And this was described in a, in a case series of 25 Afro-Caribbean patients from Martinique. So it's very rare. And these patients have a very, very high risk for recurrent stroke, up to 30%. And, and the ones that were treated with surgical excision, it reduced the risk of stroke significantly. But this is FMD when you, when you evaluate the histology, but it's much different than, than the typical FMD that we're seeing in the mid to distal renals and carotids, like your medial FMD. And we had one patient like this that was not from Martinique. He was attorney, an attorney from Brooklyn. Uh, that moved down here to work, and he had a TIA while playing basketball that was initially thought to be a dissection because he was playing basketball, but it turned out that the, he had this finding in his credible bilaterally, and it's most likely a typical FMD. <clears throat> so coronary uh, manifestations of FMD. Coronary FMD is challenging because it does not look like your typical beating on a string appearance, okay? And... There are four types of coronary FMD that you may see, and oftentimes we probably don't know that we're, we're actually seeing FMD. You, we, it's not uncommon to see smooth distal narrowing in the coronary arteries or distal tortuosity, and we always comment on that. The patient has tortuous vessels, but if they're a, a, a young, young, healthy woman, this may be associated with FMD. Perhaps more important is a spontaneous coronary dissection or SCAD, or intramural hematoma. So this is data from Canada, uh, a series of approximately 50 patients that presented with SCAD. And we have historically thought that SCAD was caused by pregnancy, cocaine, vasculitis, and other connective tissue disease. What they did with these patients was uh, any patient presenting with SCAD, they received a, either a CTA or an MRA of their brain to pelvis evaluating for any occult FMD or aneurysms. And that what they found was remarkable, an 86% prevalence of FMD in at least one vascular bed and 42% in, in two vascular beds, again, not in the coronaries. So I, I don't, I, that sounds a little high. FMD was probably what they were looking for, so that's probably a, a confounder in this observational data. But I think the, the take-home point is that in patients, that, young women that are presenting with SCAD, think about FMD, and we actually recommend our, our kind of our expert consensus is that everyone deserves a one-time scan of their brain to pelvis to look for an FMD and aneurysm if you present with SCAD. Okay, so we see this in our cath lab uh, approximately 1% of the time. It's typically a younger female presenting with a STEMI. Uh, it's slightly more prevalent in the FMD population, however. 3% of FMD patients will have SCAD in their lifetime. So F uh, epidemiology here, another case series of approximately 87 patients. So pregnancy, hormones, connective tissue disease, exercise slash trauma, and lastly, like I mentioned, FMD, um, previously unknown, but now thought to be a very common cause of spontaneous coronary dissection, perhaps over 50% of these patients. And here's an example of a patient presenting with spontaneous, spontaneous coronary dissection here, and it can be tricky to, to, to diagnose uh, angiographically, as you all know. You may have just smooth distal narrowing and not appreciate the flap. In this case, this patient had persistent symptoms and was treated with a stent and had a nice uh, angiographic uh, result. You can also diagnose, make the diagnosis of coronary dissection with OCT if there is diagnostic uncertainty. So how do we treat SCAD? We don't know, so there are no randomized controlled trials on how to treat SCAD. Generally, it's, it's similar how, uh, to how we treat carotid dissection. So conservatively, with medical management, antiplatelets and anticoagulation, if the patient is high risk, persistent symptoms, uh, injury, heart failure, shock, then revascularization is appropriate. So here's an algorithm that was developed and published in, in Jack Intervention. And it's basically saying that if the patient has high-risk features with a diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of SCAD, so active ischemia or left main disease, move to revascularization. 
if you're asymptomatic, small, small distal vessels, treat medically, and only consider revascularization if there's recurrent angina or symptoms. But most of these patients do well and reperfuse on their own. Okay, uh, last comment is on aneurysmal disease. So up to a fourth of patients with FMD will have an aneurysm in some vascular bed. That's much more common than say your, your, your older males with atherosclerotic disease that we're screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms where the prevalence is 5%. So if we can catch an aneurysm in the vascular bed and do appropriate treatment or surveillance, we're going to save some lives. Renal artery up to 30%, and I showed you a few examples of that. Both of, both of the cases I showed you, the renal arteries had aneurysms involved. So renal artery, aneurysms, carotid, visceral, aorta. Uh, so again, based on these findings, when we have a patient with a new diagnosis of FMD or suspected FMD, we do that one-time surveillance MRA or CTA from brain to pelvis, and that's looking either to diagnose the occult FMD or aneurysmal disease that may need treatment or surveillance. So how do we treat FMD? Again, we don't know. That's why we're here, and that's why we're involved with the registry. Generally, we do recommend antiplatelet therapy, uh, particularly if the patient has been revascularized, but we also su suspect that clot formation can occur in the vascular webs in the beating and, and propagate into a stroke, and so we always recommend antiplatelet therapy. If the patient had a carotid dissection, we uh, have generally treated for three to six months with anticoagulation and moved to antiplatelet therapy. Just so you know, there was the CADIS trial that was presented within the past few months. That's the carotid artery dissection and stroke study. And that was randomized, uh, a random, randomized trial looking at antiplatelet therapy versus anticoagulation in patients with carotid dissection. And they found no statistically significant difference. So it's not wrong to treat with anticoagulation for carotid dissection, but it's, it appears to be equally appropriate to treat with antiplatelet therapy, and you're going to get a similar clinical outcome. And there was a meta-analysis that showed that as well. What we don't know is, and which, which will probably be more convenient moving forward in patients with uh, carotid and perhaps coronary dissections, is NOAX uh, could be more convenient therapy for these patients needing anticoagulation. ACE inhibitors. Uh, to treat the hypertension uh, and, and blockade of the renin-angiotensin system. We, our first-line agent for hypertension uh, treatment in these patients is generally an ARB, again, because of that TGF-beta theory that I mentioned to you, the upregulation of TGF-beta and the extrapolation of the data that it's protective in Marfan's-type uh, patients. So we generally recommend losartan or herbisartan in these patients. Smoking cessation, I mentioned to you that there was a slight uh, increased risk of FMD in patients uh, uh, with smoking, so we always recommend smoking cessation. And we, we uh, also recommend avoidance of hormone therapy, oral contraceptive pills and hormone replacement therapy, although that's not been proven by any study or, or the registry. It's important to consider the differential diagnosis other types of connective tissue disease, such as Ehlers-Danlos type 4, vasospasm. I had a patient present to me two weeks ago that had a uh, spontaneous uh, hematoma in her liver and on the invasive angiogram was thought to have FMD involving her SMA. And we did a, a follow-up MRA that did not reveal FMD anywhere in her body. And uh, so I, I, it's most likely that this was caused by vasospasm from the catheter during her angiogram. So uh, that's a good example of that. Vasculitis, uh, we, we always consider a vasculitis workup in these patients and other uh, common masqueraders as well, cocaine, atherosclerosis. I haven't mentioned yet that there's no rule that a patient can't have both atherosclerosis and FMD. I mentioned that some of these uh, findings are incidental. So the more imaging we're doing in patients with cardiovascular risk factors, they're going to have pl plaque in their proximal vascular beds, and they can very well have FMD in their mid to distal vascular beds. So something to think about as well. And sometimes it's hard to, to figure, to tease out which, which is uh, contributing to their symptoms. So in conclusion, and then I'll show you a few slides to introduce the registry. FMD is not an uncommon disease. The cause, prevalence, and genetics are all unknown. 
which is why we're a part of the registry. Early recognition, diagnosis, and surveillance should be emphasized. Carotid and renal FMD both have similar prevalence in approximately two-thirds of these patients. <laughs> and always consider a brain to pelvis CTA or MRA to make the diagnosis of FMD and occult aneurysms in these patients. So that is the majority of the talk, the didactic portion. And I mentioned to you we're now, as of last week, we have IRB approval to be a part of the FMD registry, which is sponsored by the FMDSA. This was started in 2009, initially with seven centers, and I believe we are the 14th. And here are the list of physicians involved, and you, and you see, uh, looking down this list, some of the, some of the usual suspects in the vascular medicine community, like Dr. Gornick, Dr. Gray, Dr. Jaff, Chris White. So. A uh, good representation there. And here's a map of the first 12 sites, and Emory will be added to that map soon. Um, we we're proud to say. Here's enrollment uh, 100 to 200 patients uh, per year during the past few years. And our goal is at least 100 patients per year. And as I mentioned, we have, as of 2014, over 1,000 patients in the registry. It's higher at this point. And we have up to two years of follow-up data. So we'll learn a lot. Again, I mentioned we, we, we haven't teased out everything as far as the uh, demographics, epidemiology, and so this will help us learn a lot over the next few years. And what we've done here at Emory, we just completed our IRB approval. We have a multi-specialty team of experts in interventional cardiology, imaging, OBGYN, neurology, nephrology, et cetera, uh, to support these, these patients, usually young women presenting with FMD, and our goal is to enroll approximately uh, 20 patients per year. Um, over the past one to two years that I've been seeing these patients, I believe we have over 50 that are prepared to be enrolled in the registry. Um, so it's been a, an interesting project. I believe that's the end. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll entertain any questions. Brian, this is really interesting. I, I'll start off with one question. It, the, the, you know, the pathology of this is pretty interesting and really is one of smooth muscle proliferation and matrix degradation. And I, I, I guess I wasn't aware of the high level of aneurysm formation with these. So uh, I guess uh, sort of two part question. One is in terms of the um, sort of what's known about the pathology, what's known about sort of MMP activation and reorganization of the matrix, and then sort of linking that to TGF beta, is, is anything known about the SMADs as downstream signalings of TGF in this? So the, so the question was that, you know, what do we know about the SMAD, the SMAD, the downstream regulation of SMADs uh, associated with FMD? So we don't know specifically, other than that when you have TGF upregulation of TGF beta signaling that you have that downstream regulation of the SMAD protein, but not specifically what's going on at the cellular level. Uh, and I think that's important. And um, I think, uh, like I mentioned, it's, it's been challenging because we don't have uh, consistent diagnostic criteria. We had histologic criteria for 40 years. We don't know if medial and intimal FMD are the same disease. We have different vascular beds involved, including beating and aneurysm. So it's hard to evaluate genetics at the, and, and at the cellular level when we don't even really know the phenotype. So that's been challenging. Um, so we don't know specifically what's going on with the SMADs, but we know we, we've seen in those two studies upregulation of TGF beta 1 and 2 and this um, actin regulator gene that can be associated with uh, also coronary artery disease and carotid dissections for that particular allele. Other questions from the group? Peter, can we get Peter yeah, on the mic? Brian, two questions. Uh, one quickie. Does this have anything to do, or are people who are born with pyloric stenosis more likely to have FMD later on, or is there no correlation that you can find? That's a quick question. Mm -hmm. My second question is <clears throat> if somebody has a coronary dissection spontaneously, and you do the whole body scan, mm -hmm. it's sort of a so what question. What do you do with that information aside from saying, yes, you need to see me every once or two years, and if you have any symptoms, come back and see me. But is there any specific thing that you can do from that information? Thank you. And the first question, what type of stenosis associated with FMD? Pyloric stenosis, outflow from your stomach. I don't know that association. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's mm -hmm. one at all, but it's, okay. it sounds like mm -hmm. it may be similar kinds mm -hmm. of abnormalities. You okay. just wonder, if you ask these people, did mm -hmm. you ever have an operation or a balloon angioplasty of your stomach when you were a child, mm -hmm. you might find out that there is That's some a good question. Okay, the, uh, so good question about the pyloric stenosis. And secondly, the so what question. So we have a patient with a, uh, with SCAD or a spontaneous carotid dissection, and we don't know the cause. They've had an appropriate workup, pregnancy, UDS, vasculitis, connective tissue disease. We think about all those things. So they say that's negative, and we do the CTA from brain to pelvis to diagnose either FMV or aneurysmal disease. So... <clears throat> Will, will, will that change our management is the question? Usually no. The majority of the time is no. What it does do is it gives us a diagnosis. Uh, in, in, our, in our particular registry, uh, patients are getting that whole body scan approximately 75% of the time. And again, with that, we are finding that 21% of them have aneurysmal disease. So, so potentially, you could be uh, saving them from um, a catastrophic uh, event from their aneurysm is what you're doing. But then secondly, uh, you're making the diagnosis of FMD and hopefully we'll learn more about that in the future. But you're right, if the patient's already on antiplatelet therapy and lifestyle modifications, we don't do much different other than appropriate uh, uh, therapy and surveillance. It's a good point. So a question, a question from Susmita, should asymptomatic patients with pulsatile tinnitus with or without hypertension be screened for FMD by carotid duplex? So that's a good question. Again, pulsatile tinnitus is the whooshing sound that, that patients complain of. It's nonspecific, but much more prevalent in the FMD population. I would say it's, it's a high index of suspicion. So if it, it's, I would say yes, absolutely, if you hear brewy, because if you hear brewy, there's turbulent flow for some reason, especially if the patient doesn't have atherosclerotic risk factors. If it's a young patient with hypertension and pulsatile tinnitus, and you have that index of suspicion, again, why should a young patient have hypertension? That's something, something to think about. And it's, again, it's this, uh, uh, that's an important question because those are questions that we historically haven't been asking and why there's been a delay in diagnosis of five to 10 years after these patients uh, present with these symptoms. Ryan, excellent talk. It always gives me a little anxiety. I wonder how many in my career of these patients I've missed are sitting mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. But a uh, couple of questions. The S curve, is there anything you do about it? Or, I mean, do you have to resect that, or is it just an observation? You... The S curve is, is an observation, and um, we, it's a nonspecific finding. We also see it in older patients, patients with atherosclerosis and accelerated hypertension. But if the patient is younger and doesn't have those risk factors, it's uh, much more likely to be associated with FMD. It doesn't cause, uh, the S-curve itself doesn't cause symptoms or need to be treated uh, invasively. It's just, a, it's a marker. And how about the femoral arteries? Occasionally in the cath lab, you'll run into somebody, I remember one in particular, a relatively young person had severe curvature of the, mm -hmm. the femoral arteries. Uh, mm -hmm. is, that, is that a clue that we ought to look elsewhere? Yes, it is, especially if you see the beating. Uh, they, could, they could have the tortuosity, but especially if you have the beating, a smaller percentage of patients will have FMD of their iliac and femoral arteries. And we see that. It's, it's probably less than 10% or so compared to the 65% with the carotid and renals. But if you see it, uh, if you see beating in particular, the patient probably does have FMD. Uh, the tortuosity, I'm not sure. Well, great. Thanks so much, Brian. That's Thanks fantastic. So That's great. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.